nothing. Everything you said was inconsistent with what somebody else said. When you sat in there, it was like sticking your foot in your own mouth. I couldn't believe you were telling me that. Because I thought, wait a minute, wait a minute, something is wrong here. And then when I talked to Mr. McCauley, he couldn't even substantiate what you were saying. What's up, everybody, and welcome to beautiful Sacramento, California. I'm Lucky the Librarian, your trusty tour guide to the shady side of town, and today we're deep diving into the twisted world of a sweet little old landlady who turned out to have a dark side sharper than her knitting needles. Because hidden beneath the charming suburban streets of Sacramento lies a chilling tale of deceit murder and betrayal, all at the hands of one woman. That's right, today we are going to be talking about the notorious Black Widow of Sacramento, Dorothea Puente whose hobby was not just toiling in her garden, but also burying people there. Her case shocked the nation and shed light on the dangers of what could be lurking within a seemingly normal environment. Today on Bay Area Babylon, we will visit the location of where this unsuspecting landlady turned killer ran a boarding house that eventually became a graveyard for her tenants. We'll journey deep into the darkness of Dorothea Puente's psyche as we unravel the secrets behind her deadly charm, as well as the horrifying legacy she left behind and the lasting impact her crimes had on this city. I'll be honest with you folks, my stomach has been doing flips ever since I started researching this story. So grab your popcorn and your pepper spray, because we're about to dive headfirst into the spine-tingling saga of Dorothea Puente and her house of horrors, where the truth is stranger and sometimes more nauseating than fiction. Cue the music. Dorothea Puente was born on January 9th, 1929 in Redlands, California, and there is no doubt her early life was marked by instability and hardship. Born to two alcoholic parents, Dorothea was given a one-way ticket to Dysfunction Junction right from the start, and by the time she hit seven, both her parents had punched their tickets to the great beyond, leaving her to bounce around foster homes like a pinball and a machine out of control. Pointy's troubled upbringing left a deep scar on her psyche, shaping her into a cunning, manipulative individual with a talent for deception, all the while portraying herself as an innocent image of nothing more than being a sweet old lady. At the age of 16, when most kids are worrying about pimples and prom dates, Dorothea dove headfirst into the world of being a sex worker. But that didn't last for long, and she ended up marrying a World War II veteran. She became a mother in 1946, and again the following year in 1947. But motherhood just didn't work for Dorothea Puente, and eventually she gave one child to relatives and placed the other one up for adoption, as reported by Sacktown Magazine. By the age of 17, Dorothea was already making her mark in the world of crime, writing bogus checks left and right like they were going out of style. And as if that wasn't enough excitement for one lifetime, she was caught living in a brothel and did a stint in a slammer for that one. But hey, every cloud has a silver lining, right? And it does, because Puente eventually found her calling as a nurse's aide, caring for the disabled and elderly people in their own homes around Sacramento. In 1966, Dorothea married a man named Robert Puente, who happened to be 19 years her junior. Now Robert, he was habitually unfaithful to Dorothea, and only after two years of marriage did the couple decide to call it quits. But right before the divorce finalized, Puente began running a three-story, 16-bedroom care home, 2100 F Street, right here inside this house behind me. And it was at this location she provided care and comfort for the homeless and destitute of Sacramento. And sure enough, the locals viewed Dorothea as helping these less fortunate people as a very kind and noble thing to do. But little did they know who they were dealing with. And even though it all sounds innocent enough, maybe even generous and heartwarming, trust me folks, deep down Dorothea Puente was not interested in helping the homeless, but rather helping herself to whatever little money the innocent tenants still had to their names. In 1976, Puente couldn't resist the allure of wedding bells for a third time, this time rolling the dice on a guy named Pedro Montalvo, who was pretty much the life of the party if that party involved, you know, out of control drinking, breaking furniture, and a lot of screaming. With her brief stint of marital bliss now in the crapper, Plenty decided to take her talents to the local watering holes, where the drinks were cheap and the men were, mm, well lubricated and ripe for the picking. Armed with a smile as sweet as candy and a heart as black as coal, Dorothea set her sights on picking up older gentlemen with deep pockets. And let me tell you, she had a bag of tricks up her sleeve. From forging signatures to playing the old switcheroo with bank accounts, Quinny had more schemes than a comic book villain on a bad day. 
leaving her victims scratching their heads and their bank accounts looking like Swiss cheese. But as they say, all good things must come to an end. And Puente's gravy train finally did hit a brick wall. And that came in the form of the long arm of the law. Dorothea was put on probation for her dirty little deeds. But do you really think probation would be enough to put a damper on Dorothea's swindling spree? Hell no. Not our Dorothea. She simply dusted herself off, shrugged off her legal woes like a champ, and went right back to bilking old men out of their retirement and welfare checks. Like nothing happened. You know, business as usual. Now let's fast forward to 1981. That's the year Dorothea Puente relocated to this address of 1426 F Street. And it was here she oversaw the boarding house and its live-in tenants, which was mostly made up of recovering alcoholics, drug addicts, the mentally challenged, and of course, the elderly. And it was in this beautiful Victorian home where Dorothea Puente herself took up residence, right there on the top floor, and began managing the boarding house. I just want to take a second here to point out, this is the top floor where Dorothea conducted her dirty work. And by that, I mean killing and dismembering the bodies. But more about that later. Moving on. Approximately one year after taking over the boarding house, Dorothea's close friend and business partner Ruth Monroe moved into the house's upper apartment with her. Now sadly, Ruth's stay here at F Street was short-lived, and that's because she suddenly passed away from respiratory failure, only a short time after moving in with her dear, dear friend Dorothea. Now other residents had reported that Ruth had arrived at the house in pretty good health. Everything seemed to be A-OK. -okay. But after a while, she started to complain about feeling severely ill. And then one night, she suddenly passed away. And when questioned by the police about the cocktail of codeine and Tylenol swimming around in Ruth's bloodstream, Dorothea claimed that her friend Ruth had been so distraught over her husband's declining health, so much so she began playing mixologist with her own medication. You know, to ease the pain. And would you know it? The authorities bought it hook, line, and sinker. They stamped Ruth's death as an undetermined overdose, slapped a suicide sticker on the file, and called it a day faster than you can say cover up. But you gotta understand, folks, Dorothea's biggest superpower was her chameleon-like ability to morph from a scheming predator into everyone's favorite grandma. And let me tell you, friend, Dorothea played that part to a T. She dressed in vintage threads. She wore oversized granny glasses big enough to double as fish bowls, and her hair, well, let's just say she let it grow so long and gray that it was ready to drive itself to the bingo parlor. I, well, I didn't know he was in prison at that time, and he came and did some work for me. Okay. Now, they could have killed somebody, you know. They were never at the house at the same time together, but Brenda's a real bad uh, heroin addict. Now here's the kicker, folks. Even though Dorothea Puente herself was not Hispanic, she used her former husband's last name to establish herself as a well-respected member of the Sacramento Hispanic community, funding scholarships, charities, and even a radio program. You were born Montalvo, right? No, I was born Puente. Puente. Where were you born? Redlands, California. Redlands. She made large donations around Sacramento and cemented her a solid reputation of being an upstanding member of the community. She gave off that old lady innocent vibe, but in reality, she was anything but. Because as the story goes, Dorothea met a man at a local bar here called the Zebra Club. And after going back to his house, Puente slipped a Mickey into the guy's cocktail. 20 minutes later, the poor bastard lay on the floor, incapacitated, and was forced to watch in horror as Dorothea Puente looted his home for valuables, jewelry, and loose cash. Puente's luck eventually ran out, though, in 1982, when she was arrested for theft. This coming after a woman named Dorothy Osborne reported missing cash and checks from her house, just hours after Dorothea Puente had visited. But this time, the elderly woman wasn't able to con her way out of going to the slammer. And that's exactly where she ended up, in jail. In fact, she received a five-year sentence, but because of her good behavior, she only served half that before re being released back here into society. Now, during her stretch behind bars, Puente struck up correspondence with a 77-year-old retiree from Oregon named Everson Gilmuth. The two exchanged love letters over the course of Puente's incarceration. And when she was released, Gilmouth was there at the prison's front gates, sitting in his red Ford pickup, anxious to meet his new friend, Dorothea. In no time at all, the two were living right here at 1426. And to Dorothea's good fortune, her new lover was a generous, trusting man who opened up a joint bank account for the two. All the while, Dorothea feeding him one lie after the next, 
many of which promised marriage and a happy life together. But a happy life was the farthest thing that Puente had in store for Everson Gilmouth. Because in October of 1985, Dorothea wrote a letter to Gilmouth's sister, informing her that she would be marrying her brother in the very near future. And then shortly after, Puente hired a local handyman named Ismael Carrasco Flores to do some remodeling here inside the house. She also had Flores build her a large storage box, one that had specific measurements. Dorothea wanted a storage box that was six feet long, 30 inches wide and 30 inches in height. You know, the same size as a coffin. Carrasco agreed and delivered the box as instructed, but then the next day as the sun rose over the city, he was shocked to find out that the entire box had been nailed shut. Dorothea had done that. That's when Puente made Carrasco an offer he couldn't refuse, you know, for all the remodeling and the box construction he did. So Dorothea gave Ismail Carrasco a new car for all of his efforts, specifically a red Ford pickup truck. And she also instructed him to help drop the box off at a better storage unit way out in the boondocks. Well, that sounded like a pretty sweet deal to Ismail Carrasco. And the next thing he knew, he and Dorothea were driving up the Garden State Highway in Sutter County, the large box riding in the back. But here's the thing. They never made it all the way out to Dorothea's storage unit. Instead, Dorothea began acting restless and instructed Ismail to drop the box off on the side of the Sacramento River, which he subserviently did. Then months later, two fishermen were out on the river looking to reel in some dinner. But instead of getting their big catch, you guessed it, they reeled in a box straight out of a nightmare, complete with decomposing surprise corpse inside. They reported the box, and inside the police found the decomposing corpse of Everson Gilmouth, which had been wrapped sloppily in bed sheets, plastic bags, and electrical tape. Mothballs, blue urinal cakes were also found inside the box to cover up the corpse's horrific odor. Gilmouth's corpse was so badly decomposed, they classified the body as a John Doe, and Dorothea went right back to collecting his pension checks. No other problems. Yeah, this is a close-up of the area where the box was dumped. It's just about in the area where this couch is now located. It was now the mid-80s, and Dorothea's boarding house here was filled to capacity. But even though her business was booming, she still wanted more. She led a lavish lifestyle, spending money hand over fist on clothing, jewelry, perfumes, even a facelift. But when the bill collectors, well, when they came a-knocking, Dorothea wasn't exactly reaching for her pocketbook because, well, she had other ways of avoiding the tax man. With a house full of tenants now, Dorothea began insisting that she was the only one allowed to collect the daily mail. And in doing so, she easily picked out the tenants' welfare and state checks. And only after she helped herself to their funds would she then issue each of them a small taste of the leftover cash. Oh. If you were a recovering alcoholic trying to steer clear of the old joy juice, well then your old pal Dorothea wasn't just content to sit back and watch. Oh no, she'd be cheerleading you right off that wagon, straight into the arms of good old fashioned booze. And once you were three sheets to the wind, stumbling around like a one-legged pirate in a hurricane, guess who'd be dialing up the cops faster than you can say mail theft? Dorothea, and off to the clink you would go for the next 30 days, leaving your landlady free to raid your mailbox like a kid in a candy store, snatching up those juicy state checks and collecting whatever cash your family was generous to send your way. Sean most of the time because he was always out drinking. Uh -huh. and Okay. Okay, and... But you know what goes on in that residence. You are the keeper of the house. And you I are the keeper of the yard. At 8 o'clock at night. Dorothea. Yeah, and he told him a detox, take me out of your home. I don't want to live there. But after a while, Dorothea came to the realization that if she kept having her tenants arrested or incapacitated, they would eventually come back to the boarding house and realize they were missing money, confront her about it, and then, well, Things can get ugly. So with one murder under her belt already, Dorothea figured the best way to keep her pesky tenants from asking about that missing money, or even worse, getting reported to the police, it would be much simpler to just make the problem disappear. And that's exactly what happened. Because over the next couple years, several more people under Dorothea's quote unquote care, well, they went missing. Do you really think I'm guilty? There was Betty Mae Palmer, a 78-year-old who Puente scammed for over $7,000 before dismembering and burying her corpse right here in the front yard under a statue, under a statue of St. Francis of Assisi. Now her head, hands, and limbs were never found. Then there was a woman named Leona Carpenter who died of a, quote, overdose while under Dorothea Puente's watch. Puente even summoned a notary 
to Leona's hospital bed and was given power of attorney over Leona. This gave her an open door to start cashing Leona's social security checks and keeping the money for herself. Leona Carpenter's body was also later found buried here in Puente's yard. There was a 62-year-old man named James Gallup who moved into Dorothea's boarding house after being diagnosed with colon cancer. After meeting with the doctor about his condition, James was asked to return to the hospital to have a much-needed surgery. But when the hospital called to follow up and schedule the procedure, well, Dorothea explained how James would no longer be needing that surgery because he'd packed up all of his stuff and returned home to Los Angeles. But in reality, James Gallup did not reside in Los Angeles. Far from it, in fact. The place where he was residing at the time Dorothea was being questioned just happened to be the backyard of this house, directly under Dorothea's new rose bush. There was Benjamin Fink, a 55-year-old who was buried beside Puente's backyard shed. His body was found under a slab of concrete poured just days before and wrapped in a bedsheet and duct tape. But Puente's maniacal madness didn't stop there, not at all. There was another tenant turned victim named Vera Faye Martin, whose wristwatch was still ticking on her wrist when the body was dug up from Dorothea's back lawn. You also see there's some concrete in this area. Excavation site number two. Uh, the remains have been removed. I'm no expert, but I know when I look at concrete, I've been around them long enough that that, that has not been there that, that long. Do you remember well, when that concrete was put down? It had to be in the, in, the, in the early part of the year then. Okay. But that's what I'm saying. There was at one time a trench there. Am I wrong? No. And finally, in the spring of 1988, neighbors here in the neighborhood, they started to notice a sickly sweet smell odor coming from Dorothea's property. But when confronted about it, she just said it was a backed up sewer. No fault of her own, of course. But when the smell persisted, she chalked it up to it being a dead rat under the floorboard, or fish emulsion. Whatever the hell foul smelling thing that is. One thing for sure though, folks, the neighbors here were fed up with that foul smell and all of the flies that seemed to be attracting to the property. And that put Dorothea in a very, very sticky situation. In an attempt to mask the foul odor, she resorted to pouring bags of lime and gallons of bleach all through the yard here, while spritzing lemon-scented perfume all throughout the house inside to try to cover up the noxious odor whenever guests visited. But despite her efforts, the noxious smell persisted and it clung to the boarding house like a putrid, unshakable curse. But then finally, the phony act came crashing down when a social worker named Judy Moyes became, came inquiring about the well-being of one of her clients. Mr. Sharp says that. Ben was missing the same time as Montoya. A social worker says she was up in contact with Montoya up till about three months ago. Okay. Um, and she says she has not heard hide nor hair from him. And the social worker was on very good terms with him to where she yes, was. Judy. Right. And when he all of a sudden disappeared, she started thinking, what the heck's going on here? And then she got the inconsistent things about him. Then finally, the phony act came crashing down when a social worker named Judy Moyes began inquiring about the well-being of one of her clients a man suffering from schizophrenia named Bert Montoya, who she had placed under Dorothea's care right here at this house. Then things got totally weird when Judy arrived here at the house several months later to check up on Bert, only to be told by Dorothea that he had left the house and moved back to Mexico to be with his family. Alarm bells immediately went off inside Judy's head because in that moment she knew that everything Dorothea was saying was a complete lie. Judy knew Bert Montoya well enough to know that he was not a person prone to running away. That plus the man was not mentally or physically capable of handling such a large move, especially with the family he'd been estranged from for most of his life. So when Judy went to the police and filed a missing persons report, she prodded the police to question Dorothea and inspect the house. And that's exactly what they did. The police arrived here at the house and questioned both Dorothea and her tenants about Bert's whereabouts. But Dorothea, well, she had prepared and rehearsed all of her responses to their questions. But what the old lady was not prepared for was when one of the other residents secretly passed a note to the police stating that the landlady had specifically told the residents not to talk to the police. And if they did, they were supposed to lie for her. Well, this was enough to raise suspicion in the police and they returned to the boarding house several days later where upon inspection, everything upon the house just looked fine. Nothing out of the ordinary, nothing out of the ordinary. Not at all, nothing to fuss about, until 
they looked in the backyard. The police began to unearth rotting corpses that now resembled slabs of beef jerky. All the while, Dorothea Puente pretended to be as shocked as everyone else, and she put on an act so convincing that the police actually let her leave the house and go to a nearby hotel for a cup of coffee. Dorothea, of course, wasted no time and went on the run, and a nationwide manhunt was then issued for the little old lady from Sacramento. But despite her attempts to evade capture, Puente was eventually apprehended at the Royal Viking Inn in downtown Los Angeles, where she already had started conning older men at the local watering holes. These items here uh, were uncovered out of the hole that Detective Brown is currently digging in. We found an object that we're attempting to remove. Okay, another bone has been uncovered here. The trial of the murderous landlady gained so much media attention that it had to be moved from Sacramento all the way down to Monterey. And despite the nine counts of murder hanging over her head, Pointe maintained her innocence throughout the trial, claiming that she only cashed the checks. She never murdered anybody. She pleaded she had no clue how the tenants died or got buried in the backyard. However, overwhelming evidence, including witness testimony and forensic analysis, well, that told a very, very different story. Prosecutors allege that Dorothea Puente pulled in over $87,000 in her scam. Is the initial dig fine? 1045 now. 1045 hours at this time. Continuing the excavation. That can be x-rayed just like it is. Or whatever. You know, we want... Roger, did you want a wheelbarrow to put that in to sift through that? Yeah, we better sift through yeah. that. Okay, let me get a wheel. In 1993, she was convicted for only three of the nine murders, which was still enough for Dorothea Puente to be sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. Her conviction brought a sense of closure to the families of the victims, but the scars left by Puente's actions would linger over the city of Sacramento for years to come. So, what I'm telling you is not new to me. Monday, can I hire a a contractor to go in and tear everything down and dig it up to prove to you that there's nobody there? If, there, if there any digging has to be done, we're going to do the digging. Oh, okay. okay. What I'm trying to do is, right now, is save a lot of painstaking trouble. A lot of time and a lot of trouble. Uh, which appear to be possibly uh, remains in this site. And it is believed that this is another site with possible human remains. I will give you uh, an area. There's the shed, as you can see. And the one in front of the shed was another excavation site where they are currently working. And then right here. They're videoing now. We've already videoed on that site. Point to the head, please. The head is right here. Dorothea Puente's story is a chilling reminder of the capacity of evil that lurks within human nature. Through manipulation, deception, and cold-blooded murder, Puente terrorized the community of Sacramento here and left the trail of devastation and destruction in her wake. Convicted of murder in 1993, Puente lived out the rest of her days behind the cold steel bars of Chowchilla State Prison, where she defiantly clung to her innocence until she took her last breath in 2011. Even at 82 years old, she still remained a haunting figure, a reminder of the capacity for darkness that resides in all of us. If you're like me and can't get enough true crime, then consider heading over to your local library and checking out a copy of Maureen Callahan's terrifying book titled American Predator, The Hunt for the Most Meticulous Serial Killer of the 21st Century. This true crime roller coaster comes jam-packed with more twists and turns than an M. Night Shyamalan movie. Callahan takes us on a wild ride through the twisted mind of Israel Keys, a modern-day serial killer whose meticulous planning for his crimes would leave even old Sherlock Holmes scratching his head in bewilderment. 
You see, Israel Keyes had in his arsenal what he referred to as his, quote, kill kits, which he meticulously buried underground all across the United States, from one end to the other. Each one of these kill kits came packed with cash, weapons, and tools for body disposal, of course. These sinister bundles served as his grim accomplices. Keyes' macabre routine lasted 14 years, where he'd jet off from one city and then to another, rent a vehicle, and then drive thousands of miles in pursuit of his dark purpose. And with a cold determination, he'd infiltrate these homes of these unsuspecting strangers, snatch them up in broad daylight, and then in the shadows, he'd extinguish their lives swiftly, erasing all traces of their existence within mere hours. Then, with a haunting duality that even Tyler Durden himself would be impressed by, Keyes would then retreat back to his home state of Alaska. There, Israel Keyes would seamlessly resume his role as dependable construction worker, as well as a doting father to his only daughter, concealing the horrors that lurk beneath his quiet facade. Callahan's, Callahan's writing is so gripping, you're gonna find yourself clutching this book with white knuckles as she delves deep into the psyche of this diabolical villain. Callahan paints a portrait of Keyes that's equal parts terrifying and fascinating, much like a car crash you can't take your eyes away from. But Callahan here, she just doesn't stop at recounting the crimes. No way. She takes us behind the scenes of the investigation, revealing all the nitty gritty details of how law enforcement managed to crack the case and bring down this deadly bastard. It's like a great episode of CSI, only with less coffee stains on the shirts and fewer dramatic one-liners. So grab a glass of your favorite adult beverage, put on your comfiest reading socks, because American Predator is one wild ride you don't want to miss. Thanks so much for joining me here today. I sure would appreciate it if you'd take a second and tap on that like and subscribe button below. And as always, my friends, keep being the hero of your own story. And always be sure to keep the lights on, especially when reading a book like American Predator, because you never know who just might be lurking in the corners and in the shadows. But don't worry, folks, it probably won't be me. And always remember that it pays to do a background check on all of your roommates, because you never truly know what kind of evil lurks with inside a person and what they are truly capable of, especially out here on the wicked west coast, in this Bay Area Babylon that we live in. Do you really think I'm guilty? You want me to be truthful with you? Yes. I'm going to be real truthful with you. Dorothea, I think you had, somehow you're involved in it. It may not have been by your hand, but it's by somebody's hand, and I think you are very very frightened right now. You're looking and you don't know what to think and it's not just because uh, you've had any prior background because there's been a lot of people. I mean we talk, most of the people we talk to all the time so I understand that point. But the problem is I think what you realize is this whole thing is up.